Uh, my name is Al Powers, and uh, I'm from Vanderbilt University, and it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, and so um, I'm happy to tell you about work that's been going on, much of which has been supported by the JDRF. And um, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about res what's been going on research, what may be going on research, and hopefully you'll find that useful as you think about um, this. If we could. Right, so here's what I'm going to tell you about. First, I'm going to talk about some progress that's related to type 1 diabetes. Then I want us to tell you, I'm going to tell you about the pancreatic islet. The islet is a, is, a, is a part of the pancreas that makes insulin. And, you know, one of the things that happens with research is you discover new things. And one of the things that's happened over the last several years is our, cha our, our understanding of type 1 diabetes has changed dramatically. I'm going to tell you about that. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some challenges and opportunities uh, for the future. And, and throughout this, I'm going to emphasize the incredible role that the JDRF plays in the type 1 diabetes community, not only supporting research directly, but advocating for research. And, but one of the messages I want all of us to leave here is shown here, that progress requires teamwork, and it requires all of us in this room. It requires scientists, healthcare providers, the public, the JDRF, the National Institutes of Health, pharmaceutical companies, device makers. So all of us have to work together to continue to have progress related to type 1 diabetes. I'm going to begin by telling you about this man here, who's one of my patients. Uh, you can see he's, uh, he's holding these fish here, right? So he used to come see me in clinic, and he always wanted me to go fishing with him, right? He always had a fishing story. And, and you can see that there's a lake in the background, and these are catfish. And so Mr. H was 79 years old, and when he was 27 years of age, he developed diabetes. You think about the math of that. So that means it's in the 1950s, and they have told him that he had type 2 diabetes, and he was treated with pills and told to watch his calories. He didn't do well, and he had to be placed on insulin. And now he lives with type 1 diabetes for more than 50 years. So that's an incredible accomplishment to do that. And we see more and more patients now who have lived for more than 50 years. So that, but I want, to, I want to remind you of what Mr. H has happened to him during this time frame. Here are the kind of advances that have happened. Changes in urine, he used to test, he didn't have any blood testing, he checked his urine. Uh, he used to have to then give himself insulin uh, by different types of devices. He had to give you syringes, and, but all of the advances such as new insulins and now artificial pancreas. All that happened during Mr. H's lifetime. And so it's an incredibly exciting time for type 1 diabetes. So if you think about it, here's the good news. We know a lot about it. We know about the genetics. We know about the physiology. We know about new therapies. We know that the outcomes are improving. And I want to tell you about one other uh, person that I have. Uh, this is Sarah, and that's with her brother, Oliver. And Sarah's wearing, uh, I hate to bring this up in Detroit, but uh, she's wearing the, uh, the National Predators uh, hockey. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, that's, I know that, and you know, we're a little disappointed in Nashville because uh, we were in the Stanley Cup and we just lost in the seventh game uh, to Winnipeg. Uh, so, but hockey is big. And so, and so Sarah developed type 1 diabetes when she was seven years of age. Her parents noticed that she'd been tired and was losing weight. And turns out that her older brother had type 1 diabetes, so they checked their blood glucose, 300. So one of the things that Sarah points out is that our diagnosis of type 1 diabetes is occurring earlier and earlier, uh, and so people often don't become as ill as they had in the past. And she's done very well. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Sarah as we go along. These are the organs that control our blood glucose. Uh, and the, the, the brain, our liver, and our, our liver, our muscle, and our fat, but the most important part of this uh, conductor of this symphony of controlling our blood glucose is the pancreatic islet. And I want to talk a lot about the pancreatic islet today, and I want you to, to sort of be a pancreatic islet biologist uh, by the time this is over. And so let's talk a little bit about that. But, but I, let me just emphasize that this pancreatic islet, it's really what determines whether or not an individual gets type 1 diabetes or develops type 2 diabetes. So that's why we're going to focus on that. This slide shows your pancreas on the left. And your pancreas is about the size of a big fat banana. It's right in the middle of your stomach, right back up against your spine. 
98% of the pancreas is involved in digesting our food. That 2% of the pancreas that's remaining, the pancreatic islets shown right here or right here is what we're gonna talk about. And within those pancreatic islets are the cells that make insulin and glucagon, the two primary hormones that control our blood glucose. For example, here's a pancreatic islet here in this area right here and here. And this is the blood going into the pancreatic islets. It's a little bitty small ball of cells. It's about the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen and it has about a thousand cells uh, in it. If one looks at those under the microscope, this is what I'm showing you here. On the right is, is uh, here's a pancreatic islet here and here and they're different colored cells. Some of those are the insulin producing cells, some of those are the glucagon producing cells. So we're gonna talk about those cells over the next uh, few minutes. And if you had all of those together, here's what they look like here with an islet here. This is one that comes from a mouse. This is one that comes uh, from a human. Now, one of the things that the JDRF has been very important in advocating for is more work that helps us understand human type one diabetes. And the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, which is supported by the federal government, has established a program. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that program. It's called the human, pardon me. It's called the Human Islet Research Network, the Human Islet Research ne Network, or HERN. And so this is a group of about 200 scientists, and I was just in Washington uh, earlier this week uh, at the national meeting for this group of scientists, and we're working to understand what causes type 1 diabetes to prevent it and to stop it. And so this is something that would not have happened without the JDRF advocacy efforts to encourage the NIH and encourage the federal government to support research. And so I wanna give you some examples of some of the things that are going on as part of that. So here's a, a drawing of a pancreatic islet shown in the middle, and there are different groups of scientists shown in these circles here that are working on type one diabetes. Now, it's, it, it's a complicated problem, and so to solve that complicated problem is gonna take lots of people working in different areas. So I wanna show you some pictures of some people that are working on type one diabetes. They're from all over the country. They're even from all over the world. This Professor Bode Miller is from the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, and so one of the things that's required is not only doctors, not only scientists, but we also need chemists, we need engineers. And so as part of this group, we have people who are engineers, we have people who are physicists, people who are chemists who are working together to understand what causes type 1 diabetes and develop new ways uh, to treat that. So one of the things I want us to talk about now is how we think type 1 diabetes develops. Notice I said think, right? And notice I said I have that in parentheses, which means that we probably don't know exactly what we're doing, right? But here's the way we think that type one diabetes works. That we have our number of insulin producing cells or beta cells here, and that we have a genetic susceptibility to type one diabetes. A triggering event happens. We don't know what that triggering event is, but it starts an autoimmune process, meaning that our immune system begins to attack those beta cells in the pancreas that are making insulin. And we begin to lose our beta cells. And so that's why we start going down like this, down like this, and then when we've lost most of our beta cells, hyperglycemia happens, diabetes occurs. But that loss of beta cells has been occurring for a number of years as shown here. And that we think that once one goes from no diabetes to diabetes, then there's continued loss of the beta cells and all of them are gone. Now, one of the messages I want to have today is we're still in the thinking stages about what causes type 1 diabetes because when one looks at these areas of our curve here, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, it turns out that, that, that um, uh, our thinking has changed. There have been surprises and discoveries that are changing the way the textbooks talk about uh, type 1 diabetes. So let me share some of those with you. So first of all, we think people are born with a number, 100% of their beta cells uh, or a normal number of beta cells. Well, it turns out that the normal number of beta cells varies dramatically. 
For those of you in the room who don't have type 1 diabetes, you're, the number of beta cells may vary three to five fold, and that's what this graph here shows. This is the number of beta cells in people who don't have diabetes over their age range. You see there's some people that have very low levels of beta cells, and there's some people that have very high levels of beta cells. We thought everyone had the same number of beta cells, but there's a very big difference. And think about how that might affect our, our type 1 diabetes. So for example, here's that same graph I showed you where we had a number of beta cells here and here, and we began to lose those beta cells, and we go down, and then we develop diabetes. But think if you had been in this range here or this range here, low beta cells or high beta cells, your time to get diabetes is going to be radically different. So it's very important to understand why my beta cell number and your beta cell number are different because it's going to determine how susceptible we are to both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So we're beginning to understand that our beta cells, as shown here on this axis, is determined in about the first 10 years of life. So like many things in life, what happens in that first 10 years turns out to be critically important. That some people have lots of beta cells and some people don't have so many beta cells. And so those people that have lots of beta cells are going to be much less likely to get diabetes than those people that have fewer beta cells. So there's considerable interest and work now going on to understand what happens in that first 10 years of life. For example, does it happen while we're in our mother's womb? Does it happen before birth? Or is there something about the environment in that first 10 years of life that lets you have this number of beta cells, this high number of beta cells versus the low number of beta cells? Another area where our thinking is changing is what happens as a triggering event and when does that happen in type 1 diabetes? I'm going to tell you about a study that's being done in Colorado, Finland, and Germany. And what they did is they, they identified about 13,000 children that were born. They were genetically susceptible to type 1 diabetes, meaning that they had someone in their family who had type 1 diabetes, and they had certain genes that predicted they were highly likely to develop type 1 diabetes. And then for every six months, they measured antibodies that would predict that they're likely to develop type 1 diabetes. And then they said, OK, are you developing type 1 diabetes over that time? And then they followed them for the development of type 1 diabetes. And this graph shows the number of people who developed type 1 diabetes as they age. So you can see by 15 years, there were about 60% of the people here and here who had developed type 1 diabetes. And if you had two or three of these antibodies, your chance of developing diabetes was very, very high. But what I want to point out, if you look at when these antibodies begin to develop, they develop in the first five years of life here. So that means that the autoimmunity that's aimed at the beta cells is starting in that first five years. That's also the time that I said it's determining our beta cell mass. So now there's an intense focus on what happens in the first decade of life in terms of the number of beta cells and the uh, autoimmunity that's directed at that. Now, it turns out that Sarah, here's Sarah again, her younger brother, uh, Brian, also developed autoantibodies during this time period and subsequently went on. So that, that's a real-world example of how, how we have to understand what initiates this process right here. I want to tell you about some surprises that have happened. Much of this spurred by work that the JDRF has supported, and surprises in the pancreas of people who develop type 1 diabetes. So this is a pancreatic islet shown right here. It's a pancreatic islet. Around this are the way we used to think about how type 1 diabetes, that these are immune cells that are attacking the pancreatic islet and destroying it. As we've begun to study more and more human pancreases, we find out that that's not the way it looks. Our vision of what was happening in the pancreas was wrong. And when you have the wrong vision, you're not going to come up with the right therapy. And so now we know that the number of immune cells lymphocytes that are in the pancreas are much smaller uh, than we had thought, and that's beginning to revise our thinking of how to intervene in type 1 diabetes. And then finally, I want to tell you about how our thinking at this stage here where we think uh, all the beta cells are destroyed is happening. 
Well, it turns out that's not the case. When you measure with very new tests how much insulin, if a person's making insulin, people who've had type 1 diabetes for 20 or 30 years may be making small amounts of insulin. So that suggests that they still have beta cells. So for example, here's Mr. H and his catfish again. He's had type 1 diabetes for more than 50 years. Some people had diabetes for more than 50 years when you look at their pancreas, and that's shown right here, these brown cells here and here, they have insulin producing cells in the pancreas after more than 50 years. So that raises, wow, could we stimulate those cells to regenerate? Could we stimulate them to grow? Could we protect those? Are those cells different in some way so that they've escaped the autoimmune process? But that gives one hope that one might be able to increase the number of insulin cells in the pancreas. So one of the things that the JDRF has supported is work to determine whether those cells that are remaining in the pancreas are normal. So the, one of the ways that investigators have doing this as part of that HIRN, that HERN network I spoke about earlier, is they've been getting the pancreases from individuals who die of type 1 diabetes for other reasons. They're often dying because they're in an automobile accident or some other thing, some tragedy that befalls them. And so their pancreas is now studied to understand what's going on in there. And so as part of that, uh, investigators at, at Vanderbilt and a number of places uh, in Pittsburgh are working on this. And I wanna just show you some of those results. So this shows how much insulin the cells make uh, from an individual who had type 1 diabetes. And there are two lines here and here. One is normal and one is type 1. You can't tell the difference between the normal and the type 1. So that says that those beta cells that are remaining in this individual who'd had type 1 diabetes a number of years are normal. There are fewer of them, but they're normal. So that suggests that we have to find a way to protect those cells and to increase those cells. More surprises in the type 1 pancreas in the island. Much of this is spurred by a very important initiative by JDRF, and it's called NPOD, the Network for Pancreatic Owner, Organ Donors with Diabetes, the Network for NPOD. And actually, they have a booth here today, and you can talk with them. But this is an incredibly important uh, resource that the JDRF has, uh, ha has set up. And for example, it supports, it provides human tissue for type 1 diabetes research, and it supports the research of more than 150 scientists around the world. And it's changing our understanding of type 1 diabetes. I want to give you one example about that. So one of the studies that we've been doing at Vanderbilt based on work that came out of NPOD is we've been measuring the size of the pancreas using MRI. So everybody knows about MRI, you get that for lots of different things. And so what we're doing is we're measuring the size of the pancreas. This is Jack Barosco, who's an engineer uh, at Vanderbilt, and he's been leading this study. And what we do is we recruit people who have new onset type one diabetes and we measure how big their pancreas is. So this is a slice of an MRI. So this pretend you're just like cut in half right here, okay? And here's your pancreas in this red area here is your pancreas. This is your liver, kidneys are back here. This is the front of you. This is the back of you here. So here's the pancreas of an individual who doesn't have type 1 diabetes. Here's the pancreas of an individual who has type 1 diabetes. They're both 10 years old, and you can see how much smaller the pancreas is in the individual who has type 1 diabetes. And so we studied uh, over 100 people and measured their pancreas size here. And I'm showing you here the pancreas size in normal individuals and the pancreas size in individuals who have type 1 diabetes. One can see that the pancreas size is smaller. Now remember, the islets are only 2% of the pancreas. So how can the whole pancreas be smaller? We don't know. That's a total surprise. And so it suggests that the pancreatic tissue that's involved in digest food digestion is somehow involved in type 1 diabetes. So if we look at our model system here, we've measured their pancreas size at this time when they had new onset type 1 diabetes. So the question is, was the pancreas always smaller or did the pancreas shrink during this time here? So we don't know that, but studies are ongoing to understand that. 
So here's the way I want to su su summarize this research here. Markers of autoimmunity, these antibodies, begin very early in life. In some people, we don't know in all people, uh, and TrialNet and other types of studies are investigating that. The inflammation in the pancreatic area is much more modest than we thought. The beta cells that are remaining, those introducing cells, are still present in many, but they're present at reduced amounts, but they appear to be normal. In work that I didn't show you, the alpha cells that make glucagon are abnormal, and I just showed you the work about the entire pancreas being smaller in individuals who have type 1 diabetes. So as we think about how our type 1 diabetes develops, we've talked about these different areas of here. I think what we really need is we need some more thinking. We need some more research. But these questions that have come up that have been stimulated by JDF-sponsored uh, research are leading us to new understanding of type 1 diabetes. And I think it's the way we get to prevention by understanding it better. So this is a very exciting area. I've been in type 1 diabetes research about 30 years, and to me, this is the most exciting time in type 1 diabetes, either care or research, because we have so many new things going on on the therapeutic side, and there are many things going on that are helping us discover what causes type 1 diabetes. So, so far today, I've reminded us about the progress we made related to type 1 diabetes. We focused on the pancreatic islet and talked about surprises and how this has led to changes in our understanding of how type 1 diabetes occurs. And I want to conclude by talking about some challenges and some opportunities for that. One, the artificial pancreas is really an amazing, and you're going to have another plenary talk about that later today. So I'm not going to just say anything more than it's really, really exciting about all the things that are going on. But I want to put out a couple of challenges. One of those is here that as we think about the pancreas, the artificial pancreas, there's so much information, there's so much data that you have as patients, as families, as doctors, that we're still dealing with how to deal with all that data, right? Uh, and so, you know, we, then we have uh, devices that are giving us other data. People are wearing Fitbits and talking about this and all of those kind of things. How do we integrate all of this data? Uh, and so I think that's an exciting time. I think you're gonna see artificial intelligence uh, and a number of companies like Google and IBM are very involved in this space. Another challenge for the future is this, right? Money. Um, that we know that it's very expensive. This is an article in the New York Times. This uh, lady had type one diabetes and she's on an insulin pump. This shows all the things that she's taking for that. Turns out it costs $26,000 a year if you don't have insurance to pay for all that. That's in 2014. So you know well, as, as I do, about how cost and of, our, of, our, of our drugs and our devices are really a challenge. We know insulin is particularly a challenge, right? Uh, and I wanted to show you about the, here's what's happened to the cost of insulin over the time period. So this is Novolog or Humalog uh, since 2001. You can see it's gone up. This is uh, data from 2016. It's even higher then, right? So it's a big challenge and I know uh, it's something that affects everyone who has uh, diabetes. And, um, and so what, 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 where, where are we going with that? Uh, for some people, uh, they have sued uh, certain insulin manufacturers um, about that. Um, here's my view on this. Uh, last year, I served as the president of the American Diabetes Association, and we've been very involved in this. By the way, I've, I've been a, a longtime member of JDRF and the American Diabetes Association. Both of them do great work related uh, to diabetes. And so one of the things the ADA has done in combination with the JDRF is to begin to look at what's responsible for insulin pricing. So this schematic here shows how uh, insulin gets from a product to a person. And notice there are lots of arrows, right? And if you can understand that, come tell me about it afterwards, right? <laughs> Okay, I mean, so it's complicated, right? That's the title of this slide, right? It's complicated. And so how we understand that uh, and how we do something about that uh, is, is very important. I will say that uh, earlier this week, I was in Washington as part of the ADA, and uh, our organization was testifying before Congress um, about insulin access and affordability. For example, this is a Senate hearing chaired by, Dr., uh, by Senator Collins, uh, from, uh, New, uh, from Maine, uh, and there are other senators here, um, uh, Casey from Pennsylvania, Warren from Massachusetts, uh, Sheehan from, uh, from New Hampshire. So 
our, our, this is a big deal, right? The Trump administration announced uh, changes in the way drugs will be priced. So this is something where as citizens, we have to be involved, but especially we have to advocate for people with diabetes. So I would urge you to continue to be involved in the JDRF, the American Diabetes Association, in those efforts to advocate and push uh, Congress and everyone to think about how to hold down the cost of drugs. So where are we going the next few years? Uh, where will we be? It, it's, it's, it's tough to make predictions about the future. For you guys who are baseball people, this is Yogi Bear and one of his, his predictions. And so where are we going to be in 2020, 2030? Uh, how can we prevent type 1 diabetes? And I want to just uh, conclude by talking about three ways that I think we're going to be moving forward. What I call insulin administration, new insulin pumps and sensors, transplant of cells that increase insulin, or things that we do to change our immune system. And I wanna just tell you about a couple of those. So I want you to think about Mr. H and Sarah as we go forward. So for example, what's coming on the side of cells and things like this? I'm not a very good artist, sorry, okay? Uh, and so let's say here's a person who has type one or type two diabetes. One of the ways that we could give them back their insulin producing cells so we could transplant islets into them, right? There are not very many islets. This process has improved, but it's not going to be the solution for type 1 diabetes, in my view. Stem cells are something that we talk a lot about. So, for example, could we take stem cells from a person with type 1 diabetes in the laboratory, turn them into beta cells, put them back into that person? The other thing that's happening is we're um, trying to think about those beta cells that are still in the pancreas, right? That means we might be able to expand them, to protect them, to regenerate them, and, and, and in that way, restore insulin production in that way. So there's a lot of work going on in this area. And over the next decade, I think you're gonna see more and more activity and clinical trials to evaluate this. The JDRF continues to be very, very involved in pushing this research forward. The next thing is to try to modify that immune system. One of the things I want to make you aware of is, is the JDRF and the American Diabetes Association uh, working together have changed the way we think about diabetes. So, for example, this is that curve of what I showed you earlier about how type 1 diabetes developed. At this point right here is when someone developed hyperglycemia, and we used to say that's when diabetes started. But now we say diabetes starts much before that. When one begins to have those antibodies, we know that it's highly likely that one is going to get hyperglycemia. So now we're thinking about how do you intervene at this time period here? So for example, in our curve here, could you stop that process, right? Could you keep people from going all the way down that curve and that way prevent diabetes? So I think what you're going to see in the future is a competition among these different therapies. Now I think we're going to be dependent on insulin and artificial pancreases and things like that. But in the future, you're going to see a competition where other ways may improve and hopefully, ultimately prevent uh, type 1 diabetes. So, but I think as we move forward, here's the message that I have for you, that if we're going to continue to make progress, it's going to need teamwork. It's going to need all of us. It's going to need scientists. It's going to need healthcare providers. It's going to need the public. It's going to need the NIH. It's going to need the JDRF. It's going to need the pharmaceutical industry. It's going to be device makers. So hopefully you will see the value that JDRF brings and that um, you see the exciting time in type 1 diabetes, both for on the, the clinical care side and on the research side. And so it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today, and thank you for allowing me to tell you about the progress uh, in type 1 diabetes. <laughs>